I actually chose 2 Corinthians chapter 2 for our text this morning. So if you are able to stand in honor of the reading of the word of God, would you stand as we read 2 Corinthians chapter 2, all 17 verses. But I determined this for my own sake that I would not come to you in sorrow again. For if I cause you sorrow, who then makes me glad but the one whom I make sorrowful? This is the very thing I wrote you, so that when I came, I would not have sorrow from those who ought to make me rejoice, having confidence in you, all that my joy would be the joy of you all. For out of much affliction, the anguish of heart, I wrote to you with many tears, not so that you would be made sorrowful, but that you might know the love which I have especially for you. But if any has caused sorrow, he has caused sorrow not to me, but in some degree, in order not to say too much to all of you. Sufficient for such a one is this punishment, which was inflicted by the majority. So that on the contrary, you should rather forgive and comfort him. Otherwise, such a one might be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. Wherefore, I urge you to reaffirm your love for him. For to this end, also, I wrote, so that I might put you to the test whether you are obedient in all things. But one whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For indeed, what I have forgiven... If I have forgiven anything, I did it for the sakes, for your sakes, in the presence of Christ, so that no advantage would be taken of us by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. Now when I came to trails for the gospel of Christ, and when a door was opened for me in the Lord, I had no rest for my spirit, not finding Titus my brother, but taking my leave of them, I went to Macedonia. But thanks be to God, who always leads us in triumph in Christ and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. For we are a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one, an aroma from death to death. To the other, an aroma from life to life. And who is adequate for these things? We are not like many, peddling the word of God, but as from sincerity, but as from God, we speak in Christ in the sight of God. Let us pray. Father God, we come before you now and we pray for our congregation. We pray for those who are gathered here to worship you, that you would prepare us for your word, that you would prepare our hearts and minds. And Father, many of us here in our everyday lives have conflicts and things that vie for our interest. Father, we just pray now in this service that you would help those things be seen as light, momentary distractions, and that you would prepare us to give our full attention to you. And Father, we pray now for the areas who have had shootings recently father this is just a tragedy that takes place in this fallen world and it is not good and we pray for those who are grieving and hurting and that the gospel would shine in those areas praying hope to those who probably right now feel quite hopeless and father we pray for our pastor we pray for pastor rob as he is not feeling well. We pray for healing and answers from the doctors. And we pray for grace and mercy to abound within this, to, to, that you would just see him through this and that you would be with his family too, Father. And we ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. You may be silent. In this life that we're living, there are a lot of different viewpoints. And there is one thing that I researched where you can find a viewpoint in a very concise way. The bumper sticker. If you're ever sitting at a stoplight, you'll see all kinds of stuff there, right? It'll, they will say all kinds of things. But I wrote some down, 
to see what you guys think about this. So one of them said, I'll rise, but I won't shine. Whenever I feel blue, I start breathing again. My dog is smarter than your honor student. Dangerously under medicated. A barrel full of monkeys would not be fun. It would be horrifying. If all else fails, stop using all else. When life gives you limits, shut up and eat your limits. <laughs> and finally, one of them said, I'm still hot, it just comes in flashes. <laughs> Many times in life, we encounter people who have very different viewpoints than us, very different ideas, and they define themselves by these ideas. This is true. Whether it's in a simple statement that we see on the back of a car, or whether it is in their ideology where they say, look, I'm into saving the local dogs and cats. And that's good. I agree with them, it's good. Have your pets been spayed and neutered? Great, but I'm more in support of, are we gonna take up for the unborn children? And things like, I hold fast, some of them might say, that I'm never getting married, I love them, but I won't get married. I live with them, they know how I feel. Some people say, well, I'm just gonna be a success in my life. My goal in life, my philosophy is, I'm gonna be CEO by age 30. I'm going to be successful. But when you start to think about what the bumper stickers say, when you start to think about what these philosophies say about folks, they're pretty temporary. They're not eternal. They're focused on the now only. Like, what can happen to me right now? What am I thinking right now? They forget about eternity. So this morning... What I want for us to do is I want for us to ask a question. How can we as not only individuals, but as a church, live out our eternal message of faith in Christ Jesus consistently and confidently, even in the midst of hardships within the church? This text that we have talks about discipline of someone within the church, the restoring of someone within the church. And the last part's my favorite part, our triumph in Christ Jesus. And we're, we're going to be looking at this, this AM. So if you think about what verse 1 and verse 2 say, it says, but I determined this for my own sake, that I would not come to you in sorrow again, for if I cause you sorrow, who then makes me glad but the one whom I made sorrowful? Paul once before came to the Corinthians. And he had that super uncomfortable confrontation with them. This time, he's committed to coming and he doesn't want to have sorrow. He wants to have joy. He wants to be able to rejoice with the Corinthians. He does not want to have his visit emblazoned with disagreement because the church is not what it's supposed to be. Paul's very mindful of this past interaction with him. He's sensitive of it. He's understanding. He knows that maybe there are still a few twinges of hurt feelings from him having to confront sin. And so the first point that I kind of want you guys to grasp onto is that Paul came to the Corinthians wanting to rejoice and have joy, not sorrow. And perhaps we should learn from this mindset from the Apostle Paul we should come to church to worship in joy, to make much of this Christ. His wording here will only make sense to us if we understand that. He wants to come and rejoice with him. He doesn't want to come in sorrow. So when he said, who makes me glad but the one whom I made sorrowful? This starts to make sense because he's referring to a person who's realized their sin, who's repented of their sin, who's turned from their sin, in particular, this can have two meanings, two people in mind in this text. Trust me, I've looked over so many commentaries <coughs> and read so many, so many articles on this, and I cannot reach a concise decision on who I think they're exactly talking about. So I'll give you two options. One, 
In this text, he's coming to them, and Paul is referencing the man from 1 Corinthians chapter 5 that was in the incestuous relationship with his father's wife. Let me remind you of this. It is actually reported that there is immorality among you, an immorality of such a kind as does not exist even among the Gentiles, that someone has his father's wife. You have become arrogant and have not mourned instead, so that the one who had done this deed would be removed from your midst. For I, on my part, though absent in the body, but present in the spirit, have already judged him who has so committed this, as though I were present. In the name of our Lord Jesus, when you are assembled, and I with you in spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus, I have decided to deliver such a one over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. In that instance, Paul had rebuked what was happening in the church. They had not confronted a man in sin. Paul had to act when the church failed to do so. He had to correct their lack of action, their lack of clarity of the cross, their lack of good and evil, their lack of discipline. And this could be a valid viewpoint for the sex and he's referencing that. Other commentators think this is a brand new issue that has happened. John Viper says it like this. But other Bible scholars feel that this is an, another incident. That this man is more likely involved in some kind of rebellion leading to a skiism against the apostles' authority. Perhaps, and that this had created trouble in the church. Which views right? Is it the man that was in the wrong relationship? Is it a man who stirred up people against Paul? It doesn't matter. It doesn't amount to a hill of beans for any of us. The point is, one that has been disciplined and one that is seeking restoration should be welcomed back. On Paul's last visit, if it was the man who was stirring up stuff, if this man was making false accusations against Paul, using a devised strategy from Paul's enemies, the false preachers of the day. Well, this was Paul <laughs> grieving over that lack of faith and loyalty to the gospel message that this man had shown. And the single thing that would bring Paul joy outside of Christ was seeing this man, this one, whoever it be, the offender, repent and be refocused on Jesus Christ. Come to faith if need be. But I wonder if that is what we as believers in Christ seek today. Would we seek to see someone who has fallen? See the love of Christ and see the love of Christ reflected from us in such a way? Or would we naturally want to seek retaliation and retribution more? As Paul writes this text, listen to verse 3 and 4. This is the very thing I wrote you. So that when I came, I would not have sorrow from those who ought to make me rejoice. Having confidence in you all that my joy would be the joy of you all. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote to you with many tears. Not so that you would be made sorrowful, but that you might know the love which I have especially for you. Paul is writing for the benefit of those hearing. He's writing to not have a reason for sorrow. He's writing to have a reason for joy. That this joy could only happen if someone, whether it be an individual or the church at large, someone or the organization of the church that is stuck in sin or not addressing sin, would realize it, would repent, would turn from that. And when Paul has to confront these things, as sometimes we do, he did not confront the Corinthians lightheartedly. He didn't throw out a joke and say, hey, did you hear this one? And by the way, you must stop this. He labored over these things. He cried. He probably prayed much and really went through the gamut of emotions because he cared for those who were in the church. He did not set out to be the one who would convict the Corinthians. He knew that conviction comes from God alone. He did not set out to point the finger and wave it in condemnation. No. 
he wrote to make sure that they knew the special love that he had for them. Because when you love someone, church, when you love someone, you know that at times you have to say very hard things to them for their own good. With that in mind, church believers, remember something. It's not that we are any better than someone that is stuck in sin that is very obvious to see. But when we see it, we should help restore them with a gentle spirit coming to them in a humbleness, knowing that one day we may need the same thing from them. Paul came to the Corinthians in love. When we think about our lives as believers, knowing that we're called to unite in the love of Christ, to live in that love of Christ Jesus, it's not such a bad thing for us to be reminded of his sacrificial love. And so Paul here, towards the Corinthian church, towards those in this setting, he's showing a love like we show love to our family members. It's a true enough statement we probably love our family. Most of us forgive our family of wrongdoings. Doesn't matter if they're six, they're 60, back in the Bible times, 600 even. We will forgive them because we love them. But how do we as a people get the heart of Paul here? Get that heart of love to the point where we love others with that type of love, that type of forgiveness, when it's not a relative. How do we get to the point where we shed tears? Because we just want to rejoice over them following Christ and being who they're called to be. No matter the reason, good or bad, that we're crying and we're praying for them and we're reaching out to them. We, as a people of Christ, must have a deep caring spirit about not only our loved ones, but those who we call believers within the church. And not only those who we would call believers within the church, those who fall outside of the church boundaries. So we labor through life. And we need to be there with people as they rage against things like drugs and alcohol. As they rage against marriage problems and they go through the work woes. As they go through surgeries. And sometimes while people are just pig-headed. So why is it, as individuals and as a church, sometimes we fail to forgive others, to love others with this love that Paul mentions? What kind of emotion and love that Paul has shown in this instance? When one repents of a sin, when one turns from it, no matter how grievous this act, should we not welcome the one who has sinned back in the fellowship? Better yet, if we decide not to act lovingly towards someone, why are we acting unloving in that moment? Do we not understand the weightiness of the issue? Do we simply have our man-conceived ideas of what's wrong and what's right? Sometimes we don't act like Paul because we don't know Jesus or because we are being ruled by tradition. I think we all know that one person in every church setting that says, well... I don't think we should be hanging out with them. Because, buddy, I run this church. We're going to do it how my great, 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 great grandpappy did things. We're not going to welcome them back even if they repent. You have people who are stuck in tradition. We don't understand the forgiveness and the love of Christ. Because when you're looking at an offender, someone who perpetrated a wrong against you, how you react matters. Sometimes it might be that you're outraged. At other times, we may be someone who likes to point out things and act like we're holier than them. But I think we should be different than that. I think we should be the ones who, how we react, we're just peppered in our lives with the love of Christ, with the grace of Christ, with the mercy of Christ that Christ showed us on the cross. If someone seeks to make things right, how do you react? Is it like the prodigal father? The prodigal father, uh, as his son returns, 
His son's been out. He's taken his inheritance, which is a slap to his father's face. His father's not even dead. He's taken it. He's gone out. He's gambled it away. He's spent it on everything. He reaches a point where he's so hungry, he wants to eat the slop that the pigs have. He comes limping home in a way where he's like, yeah, I just, I wouldn't mind even being a slave in my dad's house to eat now. I'm so hungry. And his father meets him with grace. His father meets him with love. His father meets him in a way where this son's expectations are exceeded so much. Is that the image of you? Is that the image of this church? Is that the image of every church? Because I think it should be. Because that's the love that Paul had. For all the frustrations he had in dealing with the churches and dealing with individuals, the frustration of confronting what was wrong. He kept a love for the people. A forgiveness for the people. A love for reconciling sinners to see them being made right before a holy God and being made right before the church. He didn't have a spiritual hit list. He didn't say, alright, first up, I'm going to verbally take down this guy before the whole church. No, he could have. But as we shift here and we see verses 5 through 11, particularly verses 5 through 7 in particular, it's going to hit on sorrow, punishment, reconciliation, how we handle these things wisely through the principles of God. So verses 5 through 7 say this, But if any has caused sorrow, he has caused sorrow not to me, but in some degree, in order not to say too much to all of you. Sufficient for such a one is this punishment, which was inflicted by the majority, so that on the contrary, you should rather forgive and comfort him. Otherwise, such a one might be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. Paul had a tough job. He had to point out the sins that were present, and he also had to point out that someone can be reconciled, and not only that someone could be reconciled, that when someone is reconciled, that you should extend comfort and forgiveness to them so they're not overwhelmed by sorrow. Paul didn't want to bring sorrow to the church. He wanted to come with rejoicing, with joy, with happiness. Now the majority, meaning the church here, they had punished those who were in the wrongdoing. They refused to repent and would not turn back to God in that moment, but when they did repent, when they did turn back, they're supposed to bring him in. But if they don't, if they don't, they're not to be seen as someone to be in fellowship with. This man who sinned, though, he was humbled, whoever he is. And the church had shown its obedience prior to disciplining him. And this man, who for lack of any other terms had been shunned, the majority had disciplined him. They had already given him a great punishment. They wouldn't even talk to him probably. They had done this for the evil that he committed and wouldn't repent of. Now be a Paul. Paul's like, look, he's turned. He's turned from this sin. He's repented of this sin. Welcome him back into fellowship. As the Henry and Scott commentary says, in regard to this sinner, and to probably we, we can apply this to anything, for anybody. The design was to reform, not to ruin him. Third point, Paul urges the Corinthians to forgive and comfort the repentant person. We have a hard time with this. But it can be done. When a brother or a sister in your church is doing wrong, it can hurt. But you can grant forgiveness. But just because you grant forgiveness does not mean that there are not consequences from those past sins. If one does a heinous act, there may be legal ramifications that they have to face. They can be forgiven. Or if one cheats on someone in a relationship, it may hurt and leave scars, but they can be forgiven. If one murders somebody, it will leave aches and hurts. But they can be forgiven in Christ. 
David, the great man of the Bible, cheated on someone, and then sent this lady's husband to the front line to die. Basically, he did both of those. He cheated with someone else's spouse, sent the guy to be a murderer. Maybe someone's abusive towards kids. We think, well, then I can never give forgiveness. That they can never have the love. If they repent, if they turn, while they may not be able to do certain things and be in certain areas, forgiveness can be given even yet to them. Keep in mind, every one of you that is here today is one mistake away from being the worst person that you know. We know still that no matter what takes place, we have a priority to protect those who are helpless, to take up for the widows and the orphans, to lead our families and watch over them well, to keep up the created order from God. And that includes the fallen believer that messed up granting forgiveness if they repent. Or else they may be overtaken by sorrow. Now, just a little survey. How many of you have ever been sorrowful, have ever been down, depressed, anxious, full of just hurt and ache? I think most of us here at some point, something has happened where that happens to us. How much worse would it be if you had no one to fellowship, no one to shoot a text over, send a card, check on you to see, to counsel with within the church? You would be overtaken by that sorrow. Grant that forgiveness. When someone is seeking after Christ, seeking to make things right, and when they're starting over in Christ, it changes a life. Keep that in mind. When you're harboring resentment, when you're harboring bitterness, when you're harboring just this angriness. The church of Corinth, they had followed 1 Corinthians 5, 4 through 13. They understood this, and in essence, it says to remove the wicked man from among yourselves. And Paul says he's turning this man over to Satan. But there's something else here. Whether it's that man in the incestuous relationship with his father's wife, or whether it's the man stirring up this unity in the church, so be it. But it had to be dealt with by the church, by discipline, and then this punishment. After it is done, the restoration has to take place if someone repents. And we mess up with that because we like to harbor things. They did this to me, and I'm not going to. No, I don't want to forgive them. We become a two year old in the faith when we throw a tantrum. I want to be mad and wrong. <laughs> but when one repents, when they turn, they don't need someone whispering about past sins. They don't need someone who will declare how evil they are. They don't need someone who will give someone the constant cold shoulder even after they're restored to fellowship. For most of us, we've been in the church for some time and we understand Matthew 18 where it talks about how to make things right before a person. And it's a lot easier to read this than I think the other text because you get more with it. But it says, if your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. This is the go-to guide for discipline and restoration. It's very simple. If someone has committed a sin, something that needs to be confronted, and you go to them, here's what happens. Privately, not out in public. You don't say, hey, brother, guess what sin that you just committed? You should turn from this. You go to them in private. To discuss the fault. And if they listen, if they repent, if they turn, great, stop there, you've won your brother. If that doesn't work, you 
A few other people go. You talk to them about the confronting of this sin. If they listen, you can stop there. That's great. You've won your brother. If that doesn't work, then this matter comes a matter of the entire church. Well, you bring it before the church, you confront the sin. If they listen, if they repent and they turn and they are restored, you stop there. Great. You finally, third time's the charm, you have won your brother. But if the unrepentant person still stands before you, you treat them like they're dead. You're not fellowshipping with them. You're not talking about UK sports. You don't go grab a burger and catch the game with them. They're not having to say anything of the business of the church. They're not leading anything in the church. They are taking the Lord's Supper with you. They're not in fellowship with you. And that <coughs> seems very harsh to us. But it's for the fallen brother or sister's own good that this happens. Have you realized that normally as people, even within the church, we tend to react in one of two ways. We handle sin and almost use it like a way to judge. We come in, we feel a certain way, we act a certain way, and we're very legalistic and man-centered in how we react towards someone else's sin. Even if we don't say it, there's a tinge of judgment there. There's a tinge of us being like, <laughs> I'm better than them. Or we never really handle sin because that's easier well, I don't want to judge them and make them feel bad. and They should just be happy all the time because God is just love, right? He's, he's, he's only love. There's no wrath. There's no repenting needed, right? No, that's wrong. We are so very fast as a people to bring a person to ruin. We do this by judging too harshly or by not judging at all, by not seeking the restoration of someone. In right standing before a holy God. Now let me point something out to you. We must come at this thing with a humble, heavy heart. With the idea to, to restore one to their walk with Christ. Not to be the sledgehammer that breaks them. Galatians 6, 1 and 2 says, Brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass. Get that, any trespass. You who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness. Each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. This idea is best illustrated in Christ. His actions on the cross. He died for those in ruin. Sinners in need of restoration and saving. He suffered for their sins and showed them what sacrificial love is. What it means to come from a sorrowful standpoint to a joy-filled standpoint in your life. And sometimes we don't like to be reminded of that when we're in our pity parties. When we're happy to be mad at somebody or happy to feel bad about a situation. But this is the idea. We have reason to rejoice in the love of Christ. And so to the one who repents... There should be mercy shown, and in so showing restoration, this man who sinned will gain his joy back and not be overcome with sorrow. The church should never overstep its bounds. The church is not meant to define how or who someone can, God can forgive. That's just true. The church cannot say where grace ends. Grace abounds. Where does mercy start and mercy end? Is it as far as the east is from the west? If the church cannot define it, you certainly can. Because you, the believer, united with others, make up the church. I say this. To have a repentant sinner seeking restoration... That's worth everything. Remember that Jesus left the 99 to go find the one. The one has value. And when one repents, when one understands that they need grace and mercy and they need to be made right before a holy God, that's a distinction that's worth us realizing. That's good. 
We have to be a loving people. We have to show true forgiveness. And that's not just for the restored one's sake. That's for our sake. Verses 8 through 11. Wherefore, I urge you to reaffirm your love for him. For to this end also I wrote, so that I might put you to the test, whether you are obedient in all things, but one whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For indeed, what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything I did for your sakes in the presence of Christ, so that no advantage would be taken of us by Satan, for we are not ignorant of this scheme. The Corinthians are being put to the test with their obedience. Are they going to be obedient or are they not going to be obedient? Are they going to be led astray by strange teachings that are not from God but are devised from somewhere else? Will they be forgiven? Will they be overtaken by Satan? We being in the presence of Christ always must live to honor Christ in all things. Paul, in my fourth point, Paul urges the Corinthians to be forgiving so that Satan will not take advantage of anything. When we're not willing to be forgiving in this life, Things will fester. Bad thoughts will take root. Just the thought of that person at that point will bring about anger. People will be consumed with that hate, that bitterness. It'll just downright eat someone up. Some people seem to reside in this place. And Satan loves that. That should be expected if you're seeking to live in a Jesus honoring way, Jesus-centered way. The devil, Satan, that old roaring lion who wants to foster sin, create this unity in the church, this rest among the church so that the church is divided, not as effective, not as useful in presenting the gospel as it should be. Satan is good with you being bitter. He's good with you being not forgiving. He's good with you being used by him because he's going to outwit you if you're a crafty Christian thinking you know what's best. He's going to manipulate you within the church body and use you for not the good cause that you should be used for and glorify him and praise him, meaning Jesus. Satan's going to use you to create this unity, this harmony. When we're not forgiving, we are open to attack. Instead of finding a loving church seeking to help a sinner, what will happen is that you'll find a church that's the cold sledgehammer of judgment, a place void of mercy and love and grace, and you'll find plenty of truth to beat you over the head with the Bible. And Satan apply, uh, applauds that. Now, truth should be presented. You should be confronted with truth, but you have to have that loving way, that loving way, that mercy that's extended with that, that grace that comes with it. Or else, what will happen is that people will be way too tolerant of sin. They should be wide open for attack. Instead of gently confronting sin as a church, sin will be ignored by the church, will be ignored by individuals. That's like giving God a big old slap in the face. God, we don't want to confront others because, well, they might not like us. They may not feel loved. After all, you are love, God, and, 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 and I don't think you ever want us to feel bad. Satan's standing there going, oh, you keep doing that. Never confront sin. Go ahead. No, we must. How about this? Let's not be too legalistic. Let's not be too anti-rules, but what if there was a better way? What if this happened. We really care about somebody. Genuinely care about somebody. We care about their family. We care about their souls. We care about that person. We know that they have eternal value. And no matter the sin, knowing that they have eternal value, what if we went to them lovingly, caringly, seeking to see the best for them, seeking to have forgiveness take place so that Satan does not take advantage of us even in this situation? Let alone that person being overcome with sorrow, us being used by Satan. If we simply confront sin and don't seek restoration, that person is going to be doomed. If you took a young child, any age, young child, and all that child ever got was, don't you do that, yelling and screaming, or go to your room right now. What have you done? And they never got any love, any comfort, 
any mercy extended, any grace extended, that child's going to grow up to be a little bit disgruntled, most likely. If we treat people like that, who have wronged the church, or wronged us, or wronged someone that we know, how wrong is that? How disgruntled, how sorrowful will they be? The restoration that has been shown to us in Christ Jesus should stand as a shining example of what we are to be a reflection of towards others. Paul understood that. If a church doesn't extend grace, if we as individuals don't extend grace to a sinner who repents, then that church would be very harsh. Because unity will happen. The, the community will look upon them in a strange light. Like, I thought you were supposed to be about this Jesus thing, but you're not. We even know that you can handle things correctly and someone may never repent. They choose not to repent and they'll blame the church, they'll blame the minister. They'll go around town and they've got the blabbing mouth going on. Spreading falseness about things. When Satan has a person, man, oh man, does he have a person. He'll snag them so tightly and hang on to them and he'll ride that horse till that horse dies. And they can do great damage. Create great sorrow. But what happens if one like that comes to you and says, I've seen that I'm wrong and I truly repent? Do you welcome them back? Or are you going to harbor those thoughts of evil towards them? Well, but you said this about me and you did that by the... Would we welcome them back if they truly repented? This is the test for us. Paul says in verse 12, Now when I came to Troas for the gospel of Christ, and when the door was opened for me in the Lord, I had no rest for my spirit. Not finding Titus my brother, but taking my leave of them. I went on to Macedonia. He's looking for Titus next. He's searching for him. The door was open for him to share. Paul sought fellowship with Titus. He wanted that fellowship, and you and I need fellowship in our lives. Ministers need fellowship with other ministers. People to encourage them, to confide in, to advise them, to just kick it with. Because they have so many struggles like Paul was sharing here. Paul hoped to find Titus, but he didn't. He wanted to see his young protege, his young friend in the faith. You know, Paul had a huge concern, a huge burden for the Corinthian church. He wanted them to do well, to honor Christ, to give glory to God as they should. And he just needed someone to kind of bounce some things off of, I think. Someone to listen. Someone to see how things were going with the Corinthians and see what they thought. But then we shift here in this text. And there's this triumph of Christ in the ministry that is presented in verse 14. But thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and manifests through us the sweet aroma of knowledge of him in every place. Thanks be to God. Paul had thankfulness. Ministry has the burdens of concern and anxiety and depression and weariness and Sometimes someone just needs to get refocused by realizing how thankful we should be for our eternal life and our part in whatever area we find ourselves in sharing the gospel and being a servant and being chosen to do that. Whether you're up here, you're sitting there, you're out there, you're mowing the yard, whatever you are doing that part, there is a reason for us to be thankful that we were taken from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light and Christ. That we have eternity as believers awaiting for us. Christ leads us in trial. Now I had remembered something from studying this text, and I forget which commentary, but it mentioned that there was a Roman ceremony called the trial. So I went to Britannica.com, that's the first thing I found, to start researching this. And in ancient Rome, if a general in the army did a certain thing, a certain feat of courage, and won a certain battle, they would have a giant ceremony for them. They had to win a major land or sea battle. They had to kill at least 5,000 of the enemy, and they had to end that war. And you may say, piece of cake. This didn't happen. But when one did, there was a big parade, there was a, like music and this ceremony. 
Offerings made of animals, the spoils of war, captured prisoners marched around in their chains before everybody there. There was incense that filled the city with a sweet smell. There were chariots, there was new clothing, and the general, which had done this feat, that this triumph would have been in honor of, there was someone, whether it be a slave or whoever, who would hold a crown over his head as he went through the streets to remind him that he is just mortal. But he's done a miraculous feat. Our triumph in Christ is so much better than that. The earthly ceremony of the same name of a triumph pales in comparison to the eternal triumph of the, of the believer. We are led by the sovereign God of creation. We are kept by this Jesus who promises us the victory in the faith. And so we extend mercy grace to those who we encounter. And as the earthly triumph ceremony filled the streets with incense, the believer, as we are, are to be the fragrant aroma of Christ in this life, filling the streets and the home and the church building with the smell of the good news and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Verse 15 and 16, for we are the fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one, an aroma from death to death, and to the other, an aroma from life to life. And who is adequate for these things? Wherever the believer goes, we're to be faithful to the gospel. We are to please God in this way. Paul knew believers are the fragrance of Christ, and this poses a question for you and me. If we are supposed to be the aroma of the gospel, the aroma of Christ to those in our life, what if the only smell of the aroma of the gospel, the aroma of Christ in someone's life that they will have personally is you? Are they getting the gospel? Are they getting this Christ from you? Believers, be the fragrance in this way. In hopes of many coming to faith in this Christ. Some this is the fragrance of death. And some this is the fragrance of life. We will end like this. Doesn't matter who you are, whether you were King Solomon with all the wisdom. You're not good enough before a holy God apart from Christ. It doesn't matter if you're the Apostle Paul. You're not good enough before a holy God to be okay and to stand among him. It doesn't matter if you are John the Baptist who was called the greatest to be born among women. He wasn't good enough before a holy God. Every single one of us needs Christ. The believer knows this. And so when we come to Christ, we are the aroma of Christ to others unless we forget about this Christ. Church, we don't operate in man's wisdom. We operate in such a way that is so much better. In verse 17 it says, For we are not like many peddling the word of God, but as from sincerity, but as from God, we speak in Christ in the sight of God. We're not clever. We're not crafty. We don't peddle the word of God for gain. We're not corrupting this word. We simply present it for what it is. We present it through speech. We present it through actions. We present it in heart, soul, mind, and strength. We don't have a syncretistic message of all the stuff from our day mixed in with the gospel. It's a pure, sweet message. Jesus says. Jesus extends forgiveness Restoration, reconciliation, and grace, and mercy, and hope. The concluding thought is this. We must be like Christ. And we can only be like Christ if we know this Christ. Let's pray.